let me remind you that our context is that our Heavenly Father is a God of patterns. And quite often, He shows us in the past a pattern of something in the future, has been and shall be. And one of the most remarkable patterns He's already given us is that the coming of Christ in America, the first time, the first coming of Christ after His resurrection to America, is a pattern of the second coming of Christ to the world. The events are very similar. Therefore, and here's my premise, I truly believe that the book of Helaman represents how things were before Christ came in America, the days before his coming. And I would contend that the book of Helaman contains a foreshadowing of the days before his second coming. Hence, it's a tremendous gift of looking what will be by looking at what has been. Now it's true that in the book of Helaman, we are facing some unfortunate realities of our days and our future days. But the beauty of the book of Helaman is that the answers are there. Every problem that they faced in the book of Helaman had a solution. And that's the gift today, as we have a foreshadowing of what challenges we will face in our day, as well as the antidotes to solve them, both as a community, as a church, as a nation, and as individuals. Now, I mentioned in the introductory video that we're going to focus on three challenges. Among the many, we could spend a lot of time in the book of Helaman, but we're going to focus on three challenges that they faced in the book of Helaman and the antidote, the answer, the solution. Now, unfortunately, we won't be able to do both in a single video. I want to make these videos about a half an hour long. I think that's a digestible amount. It'll take me about a half an hour to present the challenge. And I worry about that because I don't want to leave you discouraged. If you don't come back and read the solution video or watch the solution video, it's going to be a little discouraging to just have watched the challenge video. So promise me that you'll all come back after the challenge video and look at the good news of the solution. Here's the antidote. Here's the, here's the way we solve that problem. But they are most likely going to have to be in two separate videos. So let's jump into challenge number one. Again, notice what Mormon emphasizes as he's writing. He's making commentary when he points something out. So let's start in the war chapters. Remember, we just talked about the war chapters being a pattern of our war in our day and that the Nephites had all power over the Lamanites until they made two mistakes. And then after making those two mistakes, they opened up the front door to their fortified cities and the Lamanites come in and conquer those cities. And then they will spend the rest of the war trying to reconquer the fortified cities that they lost. But back in Alma chapter 51, where were those cities that were conquered? Mormon points out, as if he's trying to draw our attention for some future meeting, Mormon points out where those conquered, city, conquered cities were located. So back in Alma chapter 51, verse 26, And thus he went on, taking possession of many cities, the city of Nephiah, the city of Lehi, the city of Morianton. Do you remember that commentary about those two particular cities? and the city of Omner, and the city of Gid, and the city of Mulek. Now, why would Mormon throw this next sentence in? As if he's not preparing us to see something bigger when we get to Helaman. The cities that were conquered by the foolishness of the Nephites in the war chapters, verse 56 continues, all of which were on the east borders by the seashore. So the cities that were conquered were the outlying cities, the cities on the edges, the cities that were close to the Lamanites. Notice that he pointed that out. Now that causes me to notice something else when I get to the book of Helaman. In both Helaman chapter 1 and again in Helaman chapter 4, again, the repetition I think is instructive. In both chapter 1 and chapter 4, the Lamanites again attack. But notice this time their destination is a different location. 
I think this is the heart and soul of what Mormon's trying to point out in our day. Let's read it. Notice verse 14. It came to pass in the 40 and first year of the reign of the judges that the Lamanites had gathered together an innumerable army. Now they attack. Verse 17 is in contrast to the cities that were conquered during the war chapters. Therefore he did stir them up to anger and did gather together his armies, and he did appoint Coriantumr to be their leader, and did cause that they should march down to the land of Zarahemla. And it came to pass that because of so much contention and so much difficulty in the government, that they had not kept sufficient guards in the land of Zarahemla. Notice how often that's emphasized. For they had supposed that the Lamanites durst not come into the, ready, Mormons, this is where the music crescendos. This is where all the music gets loud and we're supposed to pay attention. Into the heart of their lands to attack the great city of Zarahemla. Mormon is, I think he's just waving his arm saying, no one ever thought that the Lamanites would come to the heart of their lands and attack Zarahemla. Now, not only does it happen in chapter 1, but it happens again in chapter 4. Chapter 1 is kind of an introductory, and they, they didn't think about their escape, and they were kind of trapped, and so the ne Nephites kind of won the victory. But in chapter 4, they come back, and the same thing happened. Verse 4, they're preparing for war. Verse 5, in the 70 and 7th year, they did come down against the Nephites to battle, and they did commence the work of death. Insomuch that in the 50 and 8th year of the reign of the judges, they succeeded in obtaining possession of the land of Zarahemla. Yea, and also all the lands, even unto the land which was near the land bountiful. Now, do you remember, there's a temple in Bountiful. So they got to the land Bountiful, but they didn't conquer it. But they came to Zarahemla. Going back to that phrase in chapter 1, the heart of the Nephites' land. The war came to the heart of the Nephite nation. Now, I think this is symbolic. As I read other prophecies, and we'll get to a couple of those in a minute, as I read other prophecies, and as I read this story, I don't hear the Book of Mormon saying, hey, in the latter days, you're going to have to deal with war. I think it's much more specific than that and much more instru instructive. I believe what the Book of Mormon is trying to suggest that the wars of the latter day are coming to the heart. We will fight wars of the heart in our day. Not necessarily wars of conquest. Daniel had a dream about a great image, and Babylon was the head of gold. But Babylon was going to be conquered by a silver kingdom of the arms, and that kingdom was going to be conquered by a lesser kingdom. So this was a kingdom conquering a kingdom as lands began to be conquered and empires spread. Those were wars of conquest. But I believe that Helaman is trying to say that the challenge of living in the latter days is the challenge of dealing with wars of the heart, where the conflict is a heart issue. That's what's waging in our country. As I look around our country, we are fighting over ideologies, over philosophies. We're fighting over attitudes. We're not conquering land. We're fighting wars of the heart, and they are destroying families and individuals, and I've watched it destroy the lives of members of the church as we fight these battles about our heart, our issues that are in our heart. The wars in our day are wars of the heart. Joseph Smith also gave a prediction about war. Now, most people read section 87 and say, oh, he predicted the Civil War, and that's as far as they go. And it is a great manifestation of the prophet's prophetic mantle. But I would invite you to go a little bit deeper. Yes, section 87 is a prophecy of conflict between the northern states and the southern states, and it starts in South Carolina. After predicting Civil War, and that Great Britain would get involved, 
it says, and then, and then. Not necessarily because of Civil War, but after Civil War time period. Again, what was the fighting of the Civil War? We didn't change boundary lines. We didn't really conquer nations. I know the Confederacy was kind of a different nation, but what was the cause of the fighting in the Civil War? It was an issue of the heart. It was freedom for a whole race of people and issues that deal to our, with our hearts. The Civil War was fought as a war of the heart, not a war of conquest. And notice, and then shall war be poured out upon all nations. And it shall come to pass after many days, slaves shall rise up against their masters who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. Now, I would suggest that never happened in the Civil War. That is not a prophecy that in the Civil War, slaves would rise up against their masters in the South. This is after many days. Oppressed people will rise up against those who oppress them. I think this is in harmony of what Helaman is trying to say, that in the latter days we will fight wars of the heart, issues of philosophy, rights of individuals. And we waged that war of civil rights for many, many years after the Civil War. And in fact, it's still waging today. Issues of the heart, human beings, rights of certain citizens, equal protection under the law, all of those are issues of the heart where those who've been oppressed are rising up against those who oppress them. We see it politically. We see people stammering for their own individual rights. And everywhere we go, it seems to me we are fighting wars of the heart. On Tuesday night of the Savior's final week, he gathered his disciples out to the Mount of Olives and they asked him two specific questions, issues that had come up during his teaching in the temple on Tuesday afternoon. They asked him, number one, when will the temple be destroyed? When will Jerusalem be destroyed? And he answered that question. And then they said, what is the sign of thy coming? Tell us about the second coming. And Jesus went into great detail about that. We find it in Joseph Smith Matthew. It's Matthew chapter 24, but Joseph Smith changed so much, we've included it as uh, a canonized portion of the JST in the Pearl of Great Price, Joseph Smith Matthew. And clearly, he mentions war. He's going to talk about war. Now, here is the JST version in Joseph Smith Matthew. Behold, I speak these things unto you for the elect's sake, and you shall also hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for I have told you these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then he jumps down to verse 28, and he repeats it. And they shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. And one more time, behold, I speak for mine elect's sake, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So war is coming in the latter day. But notice some specific things recorded by Mark and Luke. Here is Mark's account of, of that same sermon where Jesus is speaking about the latter days. Now in verse seven and eight, he's kind of repeat what we saw in Matthew's account or in the Joseph Smith Matthew. When ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled. For such things must needs be, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But notice that Mark adds a verse that Matthew doesn't. In verse 12, he says, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. See, that doesn't sound like nation conquering nation. That sounds like fighting within the heart. Children rise up against their parents 
Section 87, slaves rise up against their masters. You and I live in a day where those who are oppressed or have been oppressed, and even those who believe they've been oppressed, whether they have or haven't, are rising up against those who believe have oppressed them. Now, we even see that in the church. There are some people who believe the church has oppressed them. That the church and the, the gospel and commandments and the way we've run our history have oppressed them. And they are rising up against the, what they believe are the oppressors. Now, that may or may not necessarily be legitimate, but the spirit of the wars in our day are wars of the heart, where children rise up against parent, brother rises up against brother, father against son, children against parents. Do you see? Wars of the heart. And if you look at what's happening in our home, just to kind of tie this to our previous idea about the war we have to win, the war chapters, it was the contention within it was the dissension from our leaders. All of those are an example of wars of the heart. What's tearing families apart are wars of the heart. What's tearing quite often people away from the church are wars of the heart. That, those are the wars we face in our day. So there is challenge number one. Now, in our next video, we'll come back and talk about the solution. How do you engage in a war of the heart? How are you successful? How do we combat when we're dealing issues of the heart? What's the solution? But there is challenge number one. And I would suggest if you look around, you see the fulfillment of this prophecy every day. From the Civil War forward, we have been fighting wars of the heart. It can't be a coincidence that in chapter 1 and chapter 4, the Lamanites get to the heart of the Nephite nation. The challenges we will face in our day, in our homes, in our families, in our wards, in our communities, the challenge that this nation and every nation, I would suggest, are fighting over. The, the, when we see fighting boil over in the streets and when we see terrorism, the fighting has to do with ideologies. People who believe they've been oppressed by someone else are fighting against the ones they thought oppressed them. We are fighting wars of the heart. Now we're going to pause, but promise you'll come back for the solution. How can we be victorious? Not that we're trying to win over someone. But how do we navigate wars of the heart? How do husbands and wives navigate issues that really get to our very heartstrings? How do we deal with family situations when children get upset at parents or parents get upset at children over wars of the heart? Race, gender, equality, how we treat this planet. So many issues are issues of the heart and that's what's causing us so much fighting in our day. I believe the book of Helaman so accurately predicted what we're seeing today. So promise you'll come back as we talk about the solution. How to engage when we're talking about issues of the heart. I bear you my testimony that this book was written for our day. And this first example to me is a powerful example because I am seeing its fulfillment. Now let's find answers and solutions. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.